Josiah Wolfblade, and welcome to Persona 4 Golden's extra content of Jungian Psychology. Um, yeah, I'm gonna be showing the basically what the Persona series is all based on, which is based on a series of theories made by a ancient psychologist uh, named Carl Jung. And so uh, let's begin with the first uh, lesson of this series of, you know lectures. What are Personas and Shadows? We're gonna find them out here. Hello there. It's time for Mr. Adagawa's TV Classroom. This lecture is for those distinguished enough to tune in. I'm your lector, Mr. Adagawa of Gekukon High. <laughs> You might be surprised to know that my day job is as a school nurse. Usually the students ask me about their health, but sometimes I get questions like this. Mr. Adagawa, what are personas and shadows? Apparently I have them inside of me. It was quite a shock to learn that there are students that diligent out there. After all, not many children would come to me asking about personas and shadows from Jungian psychology. It was due to those such requests that I decided to start this show. Mr. Aragawa's TV Classroom. Yeah, that's what this extra content is called. <laughs> I don't know why. This lecture will cover Jungian psychology, and so you too can learn about personas and shadows, and much more besides. I call it, Everyone Loves Jungian Psychology. Let us study the science of the human mind that Dr. Jung built. Today's lesson is the first installment. What are personas and shadows? Alright, let's get started. Now, I mentioned this already, but persona and shadow are terms used in Jungian psychology. These are terms used to describe the workings of the human mind. But what exactly are personas and shadows? According to Jung, there are the other yous inside of yourself. Let's start with the persona. It is the other you that comes out when you interact with others. When you when think about it, when, think about it, when you talk to someone, is that the real you? Or was it the you that the person you were talking to was expecting? Or the you that you want people to see? Either of those yous are a persona. Personas are like masks. They connect you to the outside world by acting as a medium through which you present yourself. That sounds like a bit help for other you, doesn't it? Personas are there when you need them. The shadows, though, they're the other you that you reject. A good way to think about them is the you that you don't want to be, and don't want to be of it as yourself. Or don't want to think of yourself as. Shadows are just that, shadows. They are the side of you that you keep locked away in your mind as evil. Sounds scary, the other you, eh? It appears that you need to handle shadows with care. <laughs> now, personas and shadows are both of the yous that you usually aren't aware of. So then, why are you unaware- why aren't you aware of them? It's because they lurk deep inside your mind, in your unconscious. <laughs> the unconscious is the source of personas and shadows, and is the foundation of Jungian psychology, and basically psychoanalysis in general. It's important to understand, so let's take a closer look at this unconscious. The term was originally derived from psychology. It may be hard for you to imagine since the word is now used in everyday conversation. There is a domain in all of our minds that we are typically unaware of. This is known as the unconscious. And the unconscious is a source of the mind's activity. 
So you, you, and yes, even you, all have an unconscious deep within your mind, separate from the conscious mind you're aware of. The unconscious is said to be a much bigger than the conscious mind, too, like the part of an iceberg that's underwater. You could say that Jungian psychology has been elucidating this vast unconscious. Are you all listening? Are you all still conscious? <laughs> Sounds like something your psychology teacher would say. The unconscious, hidden deep within your, inside your mind, it is a realm that you cannot explore that the power to change yourself lies. This power are the same yous inside your mind, the personas and shadows that I was just talking about. The other yous live in the unconscious, lying in wait for the chance to make it out to the conscious mind. Who are they really, and how should you go about handling them? These are the concepts I'll be introducing to you. Make sure you tune in. So far, we've covered the existence of the unconscious mind inside your mind, as well as the other yous known as personas and shadows which live there. Now let me add one thing to that, an important secret about the unconscious. This gets to the true heart and the truth about your mind and the truth of the world, according to Jungian psychology. The unconscious within your mind is actually not just yours. Human minds are all connected, transcending time and space. In other words, man man's unconscious is shared. Ah, did I forget to mention that this show will involve you in participation every so often? Meaning me, you guys won't have to answer any of this unless your teacher makes you. <laughs> When you see a selection on the screen, use the buttons in front of you to make your choice. Now that I've explained, man's unconscious is shared. I'm gonna say that's amazing. That's amazing! Reacting to the otherworldly with pure surprise, I'd say that you are made for the world of the occult. So, is this man's unconscious really shared? Have you ever noticed that no matter what the error or location, man tends to have certain sensitivities? Based on thorough, painstaking research, Jung suggests that man unconscious is indeed shared, basically by saying, you know, that where, wherever you go in different cultures, you know, when people are happy, they smile and stuff like that. I think that's what there's, but that's an example. If Jung were alive today, you might say something like, the human mind isn't an isolated terminal, it's networked. And that network is known as the collective unconscious. The original German phrase is, I can't pronounce that unless you're taking German. I haven't taken it in. In any case, in case if you're curious. Now the other yous, the personas and shadows, to tell you the truth, they are deeply tied to this collective unconscious. I'll explain this term more later, but they are called archetypes, images born from the collective unconscious. It's starting to become quite a handful, isn't it? Collective unconscious what? Archie Major what? Speak English, you egghead. I can hear the screams from your heart. <laughs> But by the time my lectures come to a close, you'll no doubt be saying that was so collectively unconscious. Man, he's starting to digress. Let's review a little, shall we? Use the buttons in front of you to answer. Are you ready? I shall ask thee. The hidden you within your mind. What is that part of your mind where it dwells? The unconscious, obviously. Very good, you passed that with ease, of course, come on. Though it's the most basic level of these lessons, let's keep going and deepening our understanding of the mind. Now then, it looks like our time is up. And the next time. <laughs> next time, we'll dig a little deeper into the unconscious we talked about today. That's it for today. Yeah. So that's basically what the foundation is. And, you know, these are just psychological... Uh, one type of psychological theories. There are many other theories out there. And it's just all interesting to know. So, yeah. We'll continue with the next one. And this next lesson is... The unconscious, it's just there, the second lecture. The unconscious is just there. Hello everyone, it's time for Mr. Adagawa's TV classroom once again. Everyone loves Union Psychology, an invitation to the you that you don't know. Today's installment is number two, the unconscious, it's just there. Do you remember the last lecture? You're not already glossing over it, are you? Now let's begin the class. You've heard me say Jung this and Jung that, but thinking back on it, I never explained who Jung is, did I? So this time, I'll give you some biographical details throughout this lesson. Carl Jung was born in Switzerland in 1875. By the turn of the century, he began his career as a, as a psychiatrist. He became a doctor who counseled people with mental illnesses. 
At the time, psychiatry was still in the very early stages of development. But there was one collect effective method of treatment known at the time. That method was hypnosis. Hmm, my favorite treatment. Through the use of hypnosis, Jung and his fellow doctors were able to treat their patients' mental illnesses. While under hypnosis, the patients displayed sides of themselves that they had never been seeing, as well as alternate personalities. So where did these hidden sides and other personalities come from? That became a question Don Jour. What were they hiding, essentially? If man could be aware of the aspects of his mind, there should be nowhere to hide. But as it happened, there was. The conclusion that the psychiatrist came to was that there existed an area of the mind that the pe people were not aware of. That is, of course, the unconscious, the opposite of the conscience. And that is how doctors like Jung first discovered the existence of the unconscious in those days. I'm sure many of you know, but the one who contributed the most to the discovery of the unconscious was Sigmund Freud. Freud could be considered Jung's mentor, but unfortunately we don't have time to, in these lessons to discuss their relationship. Basically, they had differences of opinion in their, in their theories and whatnot, as you'll see later. The unconscious was discovered by a group of extraordinary men. For now, just remember that fact. Now let me ask you, when you, feel, when you think of the unconscious, how do you feel? When I initially heard about it, uh, I didn't feel anything, but I should say that it's a little scary. Perhaps fear is the natural reaction, that which is beyond our own comprehension is always scary. It's like that in general, but perhaps your feelings about the unconscious will change after these lectures. If you tell me it's there, I feel vaguely like it is, but in daily life it's hard to believe because you can't sense it. However, Jung and the others claim that you can detect the unconscious in your daily life even without hypnosis. One way is through slips, clinically known as paraprexes, things like a slip of the tongue or forgetting to do things fall in this category. You've been in situations where you accidentally, call, accidentally called someone such as your teacher mommy, right? <sighs> what you meant to say was... Miss Psycho, but something split, slipped out. Something else sl slipped out. Yeah. The unconscious is closer than you thought. Like, yeah, it is. <laughs> Another way to detect the unconscious is in dreams. That's easy to see, no? Typically, one dreams of things that are not possible in the real world. You may have surprised yourself before with dreams that you have never experienced, haven't you? They were really beyond your imagination, weren't they? Something your conscious mind would have never come up with. Yes, dreams are quite close to the unconscious. Dreams are an important subject of the study in Jungian psychology. We'll go over that in another lecture. As a psychiatrist, Jung considered the, the unconscious to be a big problem. Why? Because he considered it to, be, it to be the cause of mental illness. This is how he saw things. In a healthy mind, the conscious was in control, reigning in the unconscious. But for his mentally ill patients, the unconscious broke free of its reins and ran amok. Hearing it, hearing it that way, you might think that the unconscious is a bad thing. But that's not how quite Jung saw it. An uncontrolled unconscious taking over is a bad thing, yes. But the unconscious itself is not innately bad. What led him to say this, you might ask? His observation as a psychiatrist led him to realize that the cause of mental illness was actually on the conscious side. When you suppress your emotions too tightly, or work too hard, or stress yourself to the limit, the unconscious makes its move. Essentially, when the conscious mind becomes overtaxed and unbalanced, the unconscious mind comes out as if to stop it. The unconscious constipates for the conscience when the latter overextends itself. Seen this way, the unconscious definitely seems like something you'd want to have. Its role is to balance the mind. Now then, so far we've learned to view the mind as divided into conscious and unconscious halves. Next, let's talk about you. The you of your conscious mind is referred to in Jungian psychology as the ego. This too is now a common term which makes things more complicated. But for purposes of this lecture, when I say ego, it will carry the Jungian meaning, or just psychological, psychological meaning. The ego is the center of the conscience, and in most respect is the mind. But it is only you in the conscious sense. The domain is the ego does not extend it to the conscience, uh, to the unconscious.
This will be a key point later on in our studies. So let me ask you again. When you think of the unconscious, how do you feel? Mad respect. <laughs> like what I've already had, really. There's the answer I was looking for. Good, it seems you understand. You can't understand the mind's true form without knowing and respecting the unconscious. Essentially, we are residents of the conscience, so our thinking is biased toward it. We take, our conceit we take the conceited view that we are the masters of our own minds, when in truth, the mind is nothing but a tiny conscience working in the, on the support of the unconscious massive energies. If you forget that, I'm sure you'll see now. Well then, our time is up. Next time I'll cover the amazing disposition of the mind, advocated by Jung. So ends today's lesson. Or just this lecture. Alright, and on to the third one. And on to the third one. Start Agawa's TV classroom. The unconscious beyond space and time. Hello there, it's time for Mr. Odagawa's TV classroom. Everyone loves Jungian psychology, an invitation to the you that you don't know. We're already on our third installment, The Unconscious, Beyond Space and Time. Are you getting everything so far? You're not fast forwarding through my lectures, are you? Let's begin the lecture. This time we'll dig deeper into the unconscious. Last time I explained the existence of the, the unconscious. But to exist implies that there is a process through which it is created. Today's lesson will follow this process behind the creation of the unconscious. By doing so, we will close in on the shocking core of Jungian psychology. I'm sure this is obvious, but when we enter the world, we do not have an actual mind. Our minds are underdeveloped at birth. As a child grows, his mind develops and the unconscious forms. It is easy to understand the growth of the body and the growth of the mind are connected, right? But how exactly is the unconscious created? From the moment the unconscious was acknowledged to exist, it was believed to come from personal experiences. It doesn't come from nowhere. The unconscious is created through what personal experiences as he lives throughout his life. In a sense, it is a natural idea. As you build experience, you accumulate knowledge and emotions, in other words, memories and recollections. It was thought that the mental energy from these memories gathered in a realm outside of the conscience, creating the unconscious. Did you get that? Let me explain it in simpler terms. As people live their lives, they experience many things, but it's not like they remember everything that happened to them. There are memories you want to keep, but sometimes too much time passes. There are old memories. And abandoned memories, memories that you actively want to forget. To put it visually, the corpses of these memories pile up, forming the soil known as the unconscious, or something like that. At any rate, memories that fall from or are pushed out of the conscience forms the unconscious. That's the common theory. Regarding these abandoned memories that I mentioned just now, in psychology this mechanism is known as suppression. It is the central subject of Freudian psychoanalysis, so let me give you a brief introduction. Jung himself also believed that the unconscious was built from a person's experiences. But, as he observed his patients, he encountered an unconscious that could not be obtained via personal experience. Scenery that people had never seen, creatures that don't exist, and events that have never happened. Patients spoke of the experiences they didn't have. You couldn't just follow them under nonsense or reconstruct memory, so he thought about why things like this happened. He then, real he then re he realized that something when he found one patient's delusion was similar to an uncommon form myth. Man's unconscious is shared. It was a groundbreaking thought, and Jung continued to test his theory. He saw several other cases in which the patient's delusions were similar to myths and legends. The existence of similar myths among regions that could have never have met also points to the shared unconscious, you know, like smiling or frowning, and you're happy or sad. With this proof, Jung advocated his theory of the collective unconscious. Let's take a look at the structure of the mind, split between conscious and the unconscious. You already learned that the mind is made of the conscious, which sticks out in the giant, hidden unconscious. The unconscious is separated into the part that is created by a person's singular life, and the part that is shared. 
This middle part is the personal unconscious formed by the individual's personal experience. And the very bottom is the collective unconscious, the part that is shared between all people. We just talked about that. The minds of all people living everywhere is shared. It's a very strange thought, this collective unconscious. But it is the foundation of the mind with you since birth. Because everyone's mind develops from the same foundation, this collective unconscious appears to be shared. Okay, everybody leaning on the fast forward button? Time to slow down. Hit play. This is an important quiz. I'm not sure how everyone who skipped the lesson can expect to answer it, but we'll see. Are you ready? Alright, I shall ask thee. Jung believed the mind was made up from the collective unconscious and the personal unconscious and the conscience. A. Collective unconscious. B. Personal unconscious. And C. Conscience. Put them in order from deepest to highest. Well, it's collective, then personal, then conscious. So it's A, B, then C. Okay, that was correct. Multiple choice quizzes are sure make prob sure make problems easy, don't they? If you can get it, if you can get just get the order of the unconsciouses right, you'll be able to get by that by in life. Or just by in that side of psychology. Now then, it looks like a time here is over. In this lesson, you learned about the personal unconscious and the collective unconscious. In the next lesson, by looking at the collective unconscious as a foundation of the mind, we will study something within our own minds. And that's it for today. Or for this lesson. And on to the next one. Archetypes, the structure of the mind. Hello there everyone, it's time for Mr. Aragawa's TV classroom. Everyone loves Jungian psychology, an invitation to the you that you don't know. Avoiding the eyes of the underground world order, here comes our fourth installment, Archetypes of the Structure of the Psyche. Huh? You want to know more about the world order that I just mentioned? Eh, I'll tell you about it later. And eh, not really. Once again, he's digressing. Let's once begin the lecture. For the past couple of lessons, I pester, you with, I pester you with the explanations of the unconscious. So I think that I have at least succeeded in snapping you out of the delusion that you are the ruler of your own mind. <laughs> Coach, my psychology teacher, Coach Weintraub, would say that's like, you know, getting rid of the free will factor, you know, of life, but... Uh, anyway. Today, we will further our knowledge. So let's uh, focus our studies on the unconscious, particularly the collective unconscious. In our minds, we have the conscious and collective unconscious. You probably see that the unconscious is a see that the unconscious is a deep ocean, a lonely place with nothing around. But Jung actually thought of it as a place filled with mind energy that can jolt your emotions. Why did he think this? It's because he discovered a special property held by the collective unconscious. We've already studied that the collective unconscious is shared by mankind, and that has, been, that has been there since birth. So in the deepest part of the collective unconscious lies the beginning of the mind created at birth. Now then, what's in there? The beginning of the mind has the basic elements needed when the mind develops. The power of the mind, the ability to recognize patterns. Jung called these elements archetypes. What allows for this basic ability of collective un the collective unconscious to recognize patterns is archetypes. Jung says that the collective unconscious is made up of archetypes. In other words, archetypes form the collective unconscious. There are, in theory, limitless archetypes, and Jung names some of them. Let's take a look at the example archetypes. I told you earlier that Jung found the collective unconscious by, founding, by finding a pattern in myths and old tales, right? The pattern itself is the classic example of an archetype. For example, in most ancient religions, there is a mother goddess that is worshipped. There have been statues and pictures of mother goddesses found in ancient ruins. Man has felt this motherly image since ancient times, and is an archetype that has been created in our minds. Now then, about the image of the mother. What function does it hold as the foundation of the mind's power to recognize patterns? Try this out. Think of the concept of the mother inside your mind. You think of the power to give birth, the power to love, to hold someone dear, right? This archetype that creates this motherly image is known as the Great Mother. Of the ar infinite archetypes, it is one of the more important ones. Interesting, isn't it? Huh, you're still wondering about the world order? Well, you just have to suck it up this lecture. So, no, I don't wonder. 
Next, I'll do a quick explanation of some of the other archetypes. The wise old man incurs the image of the old man, with the properties of knowledgeable teacher mentor. Then there's the shadow, which I've mentioned before. This is also an archetype. The shadow archetype is a dark figure and represents the properties of the hated things that you don't want to have or be. Just like shadows, we have personas, coming from the word mask. This again is an archetype. From the imagery of holding one's own face, its, its property is your role in society. And one unique group of archetypes include the female anima and the male animus images only found in male, males and females respectively, depending on gemini depending on gender. The anima goes with male, the anima goes with guys, and the animus goes with goes with girls. I'm only giving a few examples, but as you can see, archetypes are incredibly rich of variety. Boy, this today's lesson was a doozy, wasn't it? After all, are my, are my lessons like this? Or maybe so. Well, I'll make your quiz easy at the very least. Get your buttons ready. Get your buttons ready. Alright, I shall ask thee. What function do archetypes have within the mind? The power to recognize. Good one. That's what I was talking about all this time. The idea of the archetype is a central theory to Jungian psychology. I'm not going to ask you to master the details, but I hope you can get the basics down. Starting next time, I'm going to go in-depth descriptions of some of these archetypes. Some of you may have noticed by now that I've mentioned ties to the mind with mythology several times. In order to explain Jung's theories, many myths and, and ana analysis of some of them are brought up. You can say that mythology is a key point of Jungian psychology. I think the, fa the general opinion of mythology is folklore based off history with a lot of fantasy thrown in. But it seems that Jung sees myth as stories that are reflected and born from the minds of people. To oversimplify it, the gods and demons that were created by the human mind. Now then, it looks like our time is up. That's it for today. On to the next one. The Nature of the Shadow Hello there everyone, it's time for Mr. Gadagawa's TV Classroom. Everyone loves Union Psychology, an invitation to the you that you don't know. It's already our fifth installment, The Nature of the Shadow. People are often more attracted to a person with a shady personality than to an outright good person. Hopefully not. For today's lesson, I want to pick a single archetype and discuss it. The archetype is the shadow. Quite a charmer, hmm? Now then, let's begin the lecture. Just to brush up from the previous lecture, an archetype is the basic element of a pattern recognition within the mind. With that ability, the mind can create images. There are archetypes such as the Great Mother and the Wise Old Man. The Shadow Archetype conjures the image of a creepy, unfamiliar person. A creepy, unfamiliar person? That doesn't sound like something that gives off good vibes, does it? That's right, the shadow is the archetype that represents the undesirable. Jung explained that the shadow as a part explain the shadow as the part of the personality one chooses not to see. In other words, the evil within a person that he or she denies. We all have evil that we deny buried within our unconscious, that is the shadow. I'm sure you can all understand that the shadow is hated by all. But let, me under, but let me explain it in a little more comparing it to your everyday life. Alright then, say you're a student and you received a large amount of homework when you were thinking of going out. In that situation, what do you choose? Work or play? Uh... Well, to me, I know I'd have to get the homework done over with, but if I'm... I mean, it depends. Depending on you... Depending on who you are, you probably say it depends. But most of all, you know you have to get your work done, or at least for me. I know some of you might just play and not get the homework done at all. When I was taking psychology, I always got my homework done. Anyway, on time and everything, but, you know, too. So, I'm going to say work, because, you know, I, have to, I know I have to get some of it done, you know. I see. In other words, 
to you, good as having the diligence to do your homework. On the other hand, you abhor the laxness of going out to play. Laziness is your evil. That is, you do not want to become the lazy guy you hate. Even though you weren't lazy, you choose not to be. This imaginary lazy person that you don't want to be is part of the representation of your shadow. Oh, just to let you know, I meant this question as a hypothetical one. I'm not going to draw any conclusions about your shadow. If you want to know more about your shadow, why don't you, you can ask you can ask your psychology teacher. But you see, this question has shown how you use your shadow as a standard for interpreting your own good and evil. But there is another deeper meaning to this. I gave you two choices just now, work or play. You picked one of them. And consequently, you didn't pick the other. However, it's not impossible that you might have picked it. The other path was certainly a possible choice. Your shadow is the path that you didn't want that you didn't take. In other words, it is another you. The shadow is the you that wasn't picked. The hated shadow is under pressure by the conscience, often using the feeling that it should just disappear. But what, what can one shadow truly be erased? First off, it will be very difficult considering its location inside the unconscious. Furthermore, the shadow makes us recognize ourselves and gives us our value judgments more meaning. To erase one's shadow is to weaken one's own mind. Jung realized this and advised against trying to eliminate your shadow, in favor of facing it or accepting it. By accepting one's shadow, a person's mind can grow farther. If you accept this mental image as another version of you, maybe it'll, maybe it'll be easier to face your shadow, hmm? Now then, it looks like it's time. I'll explain a bit about the shadow of people, a group psyche of opposed as opposed to an individual, and end this lesson. Jung studies the mythology noted, noted the existence. Jung studies the mythology noted the existence of, sha, of the shadow. The shadows of myth, they are evil beings better known as demons. From the viewpoint of Jungian psychology, the common shadow of the people took on the forms of demons. You don't have to be an exorcist to want to rid the world of demons. But after this lecture, is it a good thing to eradicate demons? It makes you think, doesn't it? If I follow my schedule, the next lecture should be on the persona. That is, another version of yourself. And that's it for today. Very interesting. And that'll be the next one. On to the next one. Personas and sociability. Hello there, everyone. It's time for Mr. Adagawa's TV classroom. Everyone loves Union psychology, an invitation to the you that you don't know. Ugh. You know what? I'm just gonna save time and, well, you know, you've all seen this before, so I'm just not gonna say it from the beginning of the stuff. This will be our sixth lecture. We are at the halfway point. Today's title is Personas and Sociability. Deep within our minds lies the collective unconscious shared by all mankind. It is made up of the basic archetypes. I want to introduce another of these archetypes to you in this lesson. Last time we discussed the shadow. This time is the persona. The title kind of gave it away, didn't it? Now let's begin the lesson. The not so common word persona comes from the Latin word for mask. Of course, in this day and age, I doubt there are many people who actually use a mask in their day-to-day -day lives. They are mostly seen as works of art, used as interior decor. Oh, and also part of costumes, of course. That's about it. In order to understand the persona archetyped, we need to first grasp the idea of how masks were first used. Masks were commonly used in plays, festivals, and religious ceremonies. They were all used to play roles. The persona archetype name comes from this role-playing aspect. Jung find, found an archetype that played roles and named it the persona. Masks that were always used as costumes. I guess that one has used to remain... I guess the use of that one has remained throughout the ages. Now, thinking carefully, what exactly is this ability to play a role that the mind has had since birth? Let's think about it. An actor wearing a mask plays his role in order for the play to progress. So in order 
So, in the case of a non-actor, someone playing a role will progress. And here comes a question. Alright, I shall ask thee. What exactly progresses when a person plays a role in everyday life? Society, basically. Society, huh? That's something of an all-encompassing answer, don't you think? But it's also correct, not bad. When a person plays a role in life, society moves forward. Society exists because people don't do what they please. Instead, they split roles among themselves. In other words, they are people enacting roles on the world stage. They play the parts of ourselves to make up society. This ability to play a role in society is the persona archetype. The human mind is not a standalone piece, but exists as part of a network. I spoke before about how human minds are linked to the collective unconscious. The persona is a prime example of this. Every individual has the persona, which functions when interacting with others in society since birth. So you see, the persona is an archetype that's based on the premise that the human mind is collective. I might be getting technical, but due to this property, the persona is often known as the social archetype. Now when I say humans have an innate ability to connect with others, it makes the persona sound epic, but on the other hand, it presents a problem to people, especially you young ones. We're able to smoothly engage in society by using the power of our personas to become someone else. But that also means that society doesn't necessarily mean need you, so long as there is someone to fill the role you play. The persona, then, is the denial of the will, denial of the will to live as your true self. It teaches you how to become someone else that isn't you, so that you can survive in society. The persona acts as a mediator between your inner self and the outside world. When young people first enter society, many of them ask, their, many of them ask themselves, what does it mean to be me? Especially as teenagers. Here is where the ego and the persona act in opposition of each other. What should I do? What should you do? Hmm, that is quite a difficult question. This class between the two yous happens within your psyche and shapes your life in a sense. Let me give you an example so that you might better understand this a little better. Say a person wants to contribute to society and lives with a persona as an unselfish person. For example, as a policeman, a policeman or a teacher, that's easy enough to imagine, right? That person using the mediator known as his persona started living a reasonable life, making his compromises with society. I'm a teacher, so I should live like this. That man's a police officer, so he's this type of person. If we know a person's role, it makes it interacting with him go more smoothly. In this way, your persona helps you helps support your social life by making it easier for others to relate to you. The persona seems useful enough, but in that usefulness lies several traps. Doning, doning the mask of the persona also means the suppression of one's own ego. If the mask does not fit you, your, ma your mind will weaken and it will have detrimental effects on your health. Wearing a mask that does not fit becomes a burden on you. Also, spending too much time in your role can cause you to lose sight of your true self. For example, as our subject dons the mask of a teacher, he begins to act as one outside the school, and even at home. This becomes an instance of a person who has been taken over by his persona. So while the persona is useful in life, there is a danger of it weakening your mind, or overtaking it altogether. It's said that the ideal relationship between ego and persona is one where the ego controls the persona. Having multiple personas and using them masterfully which is, leads to a rich life. You shall all begin seeking out new personas to take on and live your lives with many choices. Having many roles in life. Now then, it looks like our time is up. I guess I should remove my mask as a lecturer as well. <laughs> yeah. And that's it for today. For this lesson. Yeah, that's what we struggle with as teenagers, trying to find our roles. Anyway, on to the next one.
Truth about complexes. Hello everyone, it's time for the, yeah we know, next lesson. Yeah, everyone loves Jungian psychology. For better or for worse, it's the seventh lecture, the truth about complexes. Now let's begin the lesson. These Jungian, art, these Jungian psychology lectures have been centered on the unconscious. Today let me introduce to you an important word that relates to the unconscious. Coined by Jung himself, it is now a widely used term, complex. Generally, when we say complex by itself in everyday conversation, it refers to an inferiority complex. The psychological definition is slightly different. In psychology, the co a complex is a power that prevents the conscious from functioning properly. It is not a feeling of unworth unworthiness, but the power that bends the mind in order to make you feel that way in the first place. That is the complex. I'll give you a more concrete explanation, but first, let me ask you a question. I've taught you that the human mind is split into the unconscious and the, uncon and the conscience. Now then, where do you think a complex lies? The unconscious. Okay, you've got it right. You're becoming quite sharp. A complex forms in the unconscious. That's why it can be so troublesome. Um, by the way, you could pause the video whenever these selections pop up and discuss it, you know, or decide for yourself which before I try to click it. I know I've been clicking it kind of fast, but, yeah, I'll try to slow down a little bit. So how are these com- so how are these complexes living inside the unconscious formed? In most cases, it seems like they are caused by personal experience. Let me give you an example. Let's say a person has had a strict upbringing since youth. He has always been taught to be courteous and clean. He hates sloppiness and dirtiness to the point where he will faint if he so much as touches something dirty. Even when the level of dirtiness is still within an almost person's tolerance, this person's mind simply cannot accept it. Why does he hate dirtiness so much to the point where it causes his mind to function improperly? It's, though, it's, th it's thought that this is because his obsession with cleanliness has, over time, sunk into the unconscious and stayed there. His hatred of uncleanliness has moved from his conscience and formed a complex lodged firmly in his unconscious. When this complex flows backwards back to the, into, the into the conscience, it causes the person to have abnormal reactions. I just gave you an example of how a complex forms in the unconscious through an individual's experience. This unconscious, in more specific union terms, points to the personal unconscious. Complexes are formed in the personal unconscious, which is a subset of the individual's unconscious. There are other processes that form complexes, but for now, just remember this. Now then, all people carry at least one complex, be they large or small. The problem arises when one emerges and interferes with one's social life. When a person's complex is stimulated, he or she becomes emotional, causing abnormal behavior. If this gets worse, the person may not be able to maintain relationships with other people or suffer a breakdown. I'm sure you're all thinking, then we should be trying to find a way to get rid of our complexes. But being in the unconscious, they are difficult to find, and once found, removing one is even harder. Then what should we do? I guess we should face our complexes. Face our complexes, huh? That's a very trying thing to do. And yet it is said that acknowledging the existence of a complex is, first step, is the first step to treating it. Your opinion is correct. Here is one proposed method to facing a complex. Perhaps it isn't the complex making you lopsided, but your own ego that's making your mind imbalanced. In other words, it has, a po it has a positive view of a complex that one forms in order to balance out your already lopsided mind. According to this view, when you find your complex, it is your chance to become a better person. Some of you may think that you've heard this before, and to those people, I commend you. This has many similarities to what I talked about during the lecture on the shadow archetype. In that lesson, I told you about acknowledging one's own shadow. The hidden things in your mind are not pure evil. It is important to have a good look at them. Now then, it looks like our time is up. 
Basically, we all have the means in our minds to cope with our complexes. If anyone's worried by this lecture, there's no need for pessimism. Just face your own mind. And that's it for today. Very interesting. On to the next one. Psychological types for beginners. Hello there, everyone. Yeah, we know it's time for Edogawa's TV Classroom. And yeah, everybody loves you, or at least I do. Um, but I don't know about y'all. Before you know it, here is the eighth installment, Psychological Types for Beginners. I'll be sure to ask questions that don't violate any doctor slash patient confidentiality, confidentiality laws. Now let's begin the lesson. I know the lesson is just beginning, but it's time for a question. Right now, what do you think you need to do with regards to your life? Hmm. Um. Uh, learn more about myself? I mean, I could always make friends, but you know. Oh, I see. Next, we have another question. Please use your imagination. Say you're going to see an art unveiling at an, ex an exhibit of incredible paintings. This particular painting is one that no one has seen yet. The moment you see this painting, which of these do you think your mind is going to do first? Don't think. Go. Uh, decide whether I like or dislike it, figure out what it means, try to see what it looks like, or get inspiration from it. Figure out what it means. Me. Alright, that's all I need. We're done with the questions. Still, it's hard to come up with the gimmicks on such a low budget. Still, that's the fate of public access TV. You can find better tests online. I'm sure some of you have figured it out now, but I ask those questions to find out what type of mind you have. It's like those commonly found personality tests. Like the Myers-Briggs, you know, basically. In fact, you could say that this method of categorizing people, people's minds itself, was made no my Jung. He is the original personality tester. So today's lesson is the psychological types Jung used to categorize people. He thought that two aspects were useful in categorizing the mind. The first is the direction that the mind ener mind's energy faces, and the other is the way the mind functions. It may sound a bit confusing, so allow me to expound upon both of them. Oh, you want to know the results of that personality test I gave you? I haven't forgotten about them. Let's wait until after the lesson. The first one, about the direction of the mind's energy, people's interests face either outward or inward. Are you more inclined to be interested in the outside world, or do you tend to think internally? That's the difference. Have you ever heard of the terms extroverted and introverted? That comes from Jung's theories about personalities. An extrovert likes to talk to people and strives to learn about the latest fads. Conversely, introverts like time by themselves and approach new ideas with caution. The second subject used to categorize the mind is the way the mind functions. This basically is, what will a person's mind do when interacting with something? Jung split the results into four basic categories. These are the psychological functions. It is impossible to explain all these in this lesson, but I'll give it a try. In technical terms, the four are feeling, thinking, sensation, and intuition. To simplify them, when a person sees something, deciding whether he hates or likes it is feeling. Trying to reason about it is thinking. Trying to perceive through it through trying to perceive it through shape and color is sensation. And connecting it to other unconscious thoughts is intuition. Still too difficult, eh? Let me give you an example. Say for the moment I have a piece of bread. I like it, I want it, would be feeling. Can I eat it, would be thinking. That's about four inches long, would be sensation. That would be good with a hot dog, would be intuition. That's how the four psychological functions work. So you see, extroversion, introversion, and the four psychological functions. These aspects help categorize your mind. Two times four, that means there are eight types total. These aren't all the types, there's another. There's other two that's 
been added. The uh, perceiving and judging. And you can find those on um, most Myers Briggs uh, tests. The one, the one, uh, the more accurate, most accurate one I recommend is like the one from HumanMetrics.com. So, um, yeah. Now, from the questions that I asked you at the start of the lesson, you are an introverted thinking type. Psst. I kind of knew that. I took the, I took another Myers Briggs test, you know, in my psychology class, and it was the same thing. Well, it, it had more with it. It was like INTJ. Many philosophers are said to be this personality type. Hmm, interesting. As a warning, this is just a general tendency. It does not explain a person in detail. Yeah, yeah, everybody's much more complex than that. This could be a good first step in analyzing the mind. However, it is, it's pointless to rely on this as a guide and completely ignore the complexity of the human mind. I don't want you to get the wrong idea about these tests. With his type theory, Jung didn't want to merely split the mind into categories, but to showcase its special properties. Specifically speaking, that the conscious and the unconscious regulate e uh, each other through a method called consumption. The eight types are based on the conscience of that person. But that doesn't mean that a person can't have other extroverted introverted properties or other psychological functions. They still exist in the unconscious and just don't show up on the surface as much. For example, have you ever agreed with someone that with the personality type that was is opposite of yours? That is this is because the other traits that lie below your conscience are working to help you understand. You are using another power outside of your personality, literally unwittingly. The unconscious and conscience constipate for one another. I'll mention this again, so be sure to remember it. But still, the human personality is an interesting subject. We tend to judge people based on the aspects of personality that we see, but Jung tells us that doing this is bad. If you truly study the mind, it makes you a more benevolent person, like me! <laughs> now then, it looks like it's time. That's it for today. And on to the next one. Interpreting dreams. Hello there, everyone. It's time for Mr. Gadagawa's TV classroom, and yeah, we are in the ninth installment, coming up on the home stretch. This time, we're discussing interpreting dreams. Now, let's begin the lecture. So far, we've discussed archetypes and psychological types, thing that's, things that Jung was famous for. This time, let's learn about another distinctive feature of Jungian psychology dream analysis. As the name implies, dream analysis is the study of psychological meanings behind dreams. It's com it is, this is commonly used as a synonym for Jungian psychology as a whole. Of course, Jung himself used dream analysis to treat his patients. The mysticality and flamboyancy of that idea must make it popular. It's true that dreams are probably the most incomprehensible phenomenon of the human mind. You've already heard me mention dreams before in my previous lectures, right? I said that dreams are proof of the existence of the unconscious. Dreams and the unconscious are very closely related. That will be the starting point of today's lecture. The first person to point out the connection between dreams and the unconscious was Freud, Jung's mentor. Remember him, right? Yes, that Freud. Freud studied dreams and noticed that there are lots of elements that fulfilled the dreamer's desires. He thought that the dreams were a phenomena where the desires of the unconscious relapse into the conscience during sleep. To be blunt, you see dreams in order to feel good. I believe Jung's Freud's theory is quite convincing, but Jung's view varies a bit from it. Jung heard about the dreams from his patients, as well as recorded and studied his own dreams in hopes of learning the cause. The core of dreams is the basic property of the mind's function, something Jung himself theorized. I talked about this with the personality types. Do you remember that? What Jung saw as the mechanism behind dreams is the mind's tendency to contemplate. In other words, he believed that dreams occur due to the power of the conscience and unconscious contemplating for each other. I feel like I've been repeating myself, but just this one more time. Within the mind, the conscience and the unconscious contemplate for each other's imbalances. They try to fix erroneous and incomplete parts of, itself, of each other. 
and one such method of constipation is through dreams. It sounds still a little complicated, I know. Putting it into graphics, the unconscious is sending dreams to the su to support the conscience. Just remember that. It's trying to fix erroneous and incomplete parts of the conscience. Dreams are the unconscious quips to, to the conscience. That may that maybe that's going a bit too light on the subject. At any rate, just remember that dreams happen to constipate for erroneous and incomplete parts of the conscience. This is just a basic explanation of dreams. There's a lot more variety when you go into the details. I'm going to be a little bold and try to and try to use more technical terms to describe what I mean here. The dreams that are based on things that you are aware of and help you think about them are called consummatory. Conversely, non-consummatory dreams are ones that can help you sort out potential problems from external sources. Non-consummatory dreams don't reflect the conscious mind but can still be helpful in their own way. Those are, those are the complete dreams, the dreams that your unconscious delivers to the conscience. There are also incomplete versions that get thrown into the conscious as well. There are reiterative dreams that show events from real life. It's pretty much your memory replay its brain playing itself. Physiological dreams are dreams that you have because of physical influences on your body while you're sleeping. So to recap, conservatory and not so conservatory dreams, along with reiterative and psychological dreams. You don't need to remember all that in detail. Just remember that there are several types and levels of dreams. I try to remember. I like your passion towards your studies. I'll try to. Go, um, I was going to leave this out, but I want to pass Jung's ambition on. Listen carefully. Jung did describe a very special type of dream, prophetic dreams. The other types had explanations that made sense, although it may take some effort to figure them out. But it's hard to give a reasonable explanation of for prophetic dreams. Prophetic dreams predict the future. But there is no explanation given as to how anyone can predict events that they have no way of possibly knowing. Some trick, an erroneous report. And even, even after going through these, Jung was left with the fact that they do exist. However, instead of denying or ignoring that type of dream, he tried to expound upon it. In the process, he began to look for the existence of telepathic power. That's for another time. So you see, there are some dreams that not even uh, Jung was able, even able to describe. Jung's uh, achievements expand all sorts of places, so it's easy to get off track. Now let's get back to dream analysis. Now I'm sure that after hearing all that, all this, some of you want, out there want to start analyzing your own dreams. I don't blame you. Is it really possible? Let's say you have a certain, a certain dream, and continue on from there. For this example, you've had a dream in which your father turned into a lizard man. And at the dinner table, old lizard dad is sitting there like normal, talking about the next vacation you'll take. After seeing this powerful image, you'll feel that this dream has to mean something and search for an answer. So you check books and search the web for things like li about lizards and dreams, looking for template interpretations. But Jung worried that, about that this interpretation is only a one-sided analysis. After all, lizards might hold some deep personal meaning to you that isn't the same as other people's. So, continuing on with the lizard dream, hmm, are lizards too creepy? Should I change lizard dad into a marshmallow man for this example? Um, uh, Let's make him a marshmallow, or let's say with lizard dad. Let's stay with lizard dad. That lizard might be a representation formed by the unconscious mind to express something creepy, an enemy. But it might be something other than the common image. Maybe you like lizards, or the first lizard you saw impressed you. In other words, your personal lizard may not be the lizard that other people perceive in their unconscious. So is the thing you see in your dream a symbol, or are you dreaming about the thing itself? Without figuring out the difference, you'll have, to, you'll have a hard time figuring out what your dreams are trying to say. That is to say, your unconscious is calling out to you but you either aren't hearing it, or are taking it the wrong way. Jung proposed a method to solve this problem. That method is association. In this method, you ask the individual to expand on the personal experiences that they had with images in the dreams. 
In regards to the lizard, what do you think of when you hear the word lizard? What did it look like? What do you, what do you remember about it? Basically, you talk with the person and expand on the meaning of the dream, leading to a deeper, deeper interpretation. Jung proposed another method, noting that dreams are stories created by the unconscious. Just as dreams are stories created by the unconscious for the individual, he took notice that there were stories created by the unconscious for the, for the collective. Those stories are ancient mythology. He advocated the method of comparing, them to, comparing dreams to myths. This is known as amplification. If a dream in question is hard to interpret by personal experience, looking at similar myths may lead may lend a hint about its meaning. Not only myths, but fairy tales and the, li and the like are also used. Using these past examples in archives, you would supplement the dreams and interpret them. Yeah, leave it to the experts. Accurate dreams, accurate dream interpretation is using both association and application is very difficult. Long conversations and personal counseling are necessary and the analyst must be proficient. I must say, dream interpretation is not an easy task. Quick interpretations may be fun, but they lack credibility. While it is important to lend your ear to the unconscious, being tied down by an inexperienced interpretation would actually make the dream harmful. Which means, leave it to the experts, kids. Now then, it looks like that that's it. And that's it for today. You know, for this lesson. And on to the final one. And on to the final one. Deeper into Jungian psychology. Hello, yes, this is the final lecture. You know, everyone loves Jungian psychology. You know, you that you didn't know, no. In this final lesson, our grand finale, deeper into Jungian psychology. Is this ever going to end? It's hard to say, isn't it? Well, yeah, it ends with this. Jung, about, this mostly tells about Jung's life. Looking back, the unconscious, the collective unconscious, the shadow and persona archetypes, complexes, personality types, and dream interpretation, I've managed to introduce the main points of Jungian psychology to you. If you're a high school student, it might have been a bit difficult. A bit, it might have been a bit hard for you, unless you like it. But you did well to come this far. Though I think we can ease off of the lectures. Some of you might want to go even farther. Get promoted, Molt. For those people, I'll be glad to show you the next step. So today we'll talk about the power that helped Jung formulate his superhuman-like theories. And it's a bit weird. I'll, 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 I'll warn you. His interest in the mystical, what you would call the occult. From the start to finish, his life has always been influenced by occult-like things. That was his fate, it was in his DNA. He was born in the Switzerland countryside to a family that was close to spirits. To be more specific, his father was a pastor and his mother was from a bloodline that could sense spirits. I think it's safe to say that this environment helped him foster an interest in religion and the spiritual. In fact, he did experience something psychologically and at the important. For instance, when he was three or four years old, quite young, he had a dream he was unable to forget. It was a terrifying dream. In a throne room, past an underground tunnel, he saw a giant pillar of flesh known as the Man-Eater. That dream may have been the starting point for this passion towards dream interpretation. On top of that, Jung took notice of another personality within himself at an early age. This other personality was an old, dignified man who consipated for his feelings of inferiority as a boy. This sounds a lot like the proposed archetypes he later said. The wise old man, doesn't it? Yeah, it does kind of sound like it. It can't be said for sure that Jung's blood or upbringing caused this. But throughout his life, he had multiple experiences with poltergeist phenomena. A, a poltergeist is a ghost, basically. <clears throat> that causes pranks. Some cases include his family oak, ta oak table splitting into two and a steel bread knife shattering. Jung was also interested in the paranormal from a young age. He participated in a gathering to summon the spirits of the dead held by a cousin who was a medium. It really shows how interested Jung 
was about the occult. When Jung had been walking the path of psychiatry, he analyzed the things that occurred at that seminar. While Jung thought there were psychological psychological meaning, Freud warned against getting too deep into the occult. One of the factors that in the deteri- deterioration of the relationships was this difference in viewpoints regarding the occult. Well, they did also disagree on some theories on psychoanalysis and had some personal instances, but around the time, Jung had parted ways from Freud and he had a certain health problem. He himself became mentally ill. His mind having become so ill, he would see visions and delusions. That's kind of sad. Even as he suffered this illness, he drew upon his experience as a psychiatrist and turned it into a subject of study. So what kind of visions did he see? Let me introduce one of them. There was a time when he saw visions of Europe ending with a giant flood. A few months later, the first world war broke out. His vision became a reality. It sounds like a prophetic dream, doesn't it? Jung interpreted his this occurrence as the result of the unconscious sensing the oncoming danger of the war. During this time, he also came across ghosts. According to him, after a group of ghosts burst into his house, he then spent 3 days writing an essay. In a sense, he acknowledged the existence of ghosts. But he saw these those ghosts as projections of his unconscious. Treating people as a psychiatrist, sometime he came into experiences that surpassed rational thought. Jung was interested in things like that as well. Our later one known antidote about Jung as an example. This happened when he was talking with a female patient interpreting her dreams. She was talking about a golden scarab in a dream, and at that moment, an actual beetle flew into the room. When this occurred, her mind was altered, and so was the treatment. Jung took notice of this mechanism of coincidence. This meaningful coincidence leads to synchronicity and constellation. Jung intertwined these archetypes and theorized about the well, we'll skipping that, maybe another time. Jung also was interested in Eastern religion and ideology, which was a rare study at the time. Hindu philosophy and Zen ideology, Chinese fortune telling, alchemy. His inspirations came from everywhere. Take the mandala for example. That's a type of art in the Buddhist and Hindu religions, usually with many gods and Buddhas drawn on them. He realized that there was a similarity between the structure of the art of that art and the treatment he underwent during his illness. Jung knew from his experience that you can see the statue of the state of the mind through painting a circle. He found a common point between drawing a circle and mandalas. It seemed he tried expanding his knowledge of relations that science couldn't explain by reading the I Ching, a Chinese system. Jung's ideas of synchronicity and meaningful coincidences were influenced by the I Ching. Now then, when talking about Jung's achievements and the occult, you can't not mention alchemy. Alchemy is a magical technology that people dreamed of long ago, famously to turn lead into gold. Jung interpreted the principle of the process as a representation of individualization. The influence of alchemy on Jung's as obvious, as he left several works on alchemy. He really took an interest in the alchemical concept of the union of opposites. Things of the opposite properties eventually becoming one complete object. That idea became one of Jungian psychology's roots. Going in this far end, you almost feel as all this talk of the occult study is good is rather mild. Jung built up his original knowledge not only through psychiatric study, but by digging deep into the occult. He sure had a lot of energy. Yeah, he sure got sidetracked too. It sounds. Not only did he take on ancient things like mythology, but he also integrated new mysteries into his studies, modern mysteries such as UFOs. Their very existence is doubtful, but you tried to explain on the existence of UFOs, and his results were well. I'll make this short. UFOs are the icons of postmodern modern society, and the, are the icons of postmodern society and anxiety coming from the collective unconscious. UFOs are the modern-day Mandela. To sum it up, perhaps you'll be able to understand what that means with the knowledge you've gained through these lessons. To illustrate how deeply Jung delved into the experiences of Asian ideology and theology, in his later years, he attended Eranos, an intellectual exchange for all sorts of thinkers all across the world. He directly and continually exchanged ideas and opinions with some of the best scholars in a number of fields. Jung associated with a variety of famed minds, even outside Eranos. The author of Hesse, 
the physicist Polly, and many big politicians were among his associates outside of his field. His achievements, influenced by a variety of people, have surpassed the borders of psychology and psychiatry. His work is not limited to psychiatrists, philosophers, philosophers, art, authors, and artists as well found inspiration in his works. He was one of the few psycho psychologists to actually influence the way people think. It was actually kind of cool, if you ask me. This final lecture was a lot to swallow, but if anything I said interests you, I encourage you to look it up. I'm sure, you, I'm sure something deep within your conscience will change or give you the opportunity to change. Oh, and because these lessons are all my own personal opinions, I end on a disclaimer that no effects are guaranteed. <laughs> Until we meet again. And that was pretty much it. It was all pretty much interesting on the on the cycle on, uh, analytic theory of psychology. So it was great to learn all this. So that's it for the. Uh the Persona 4 Golden's uh, Extra Content Union Psychology Lessons. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this. This was pretty an interesting uh, stuff to know, you know, to learn about yourself and discover more, you know, about others and everything and understand each other and how we all work. Um, but if you're curious about what your persona and shadow may actually be, um, one of the first steps you want to do is that I'll, I've already posted the, uh, the link to humanmetrics.com, a Myers-Briggs test at the uh, the bottom, and from there, um, you can pretty much take the test and figure out the results of one of your 16 personality types, and, you know, all you have to do is just figure out what your personality type is, like for example, mine was NITJ, INTJ, and you know, all you have to do, you can know, you can find out about more about the results of what your personality type is and then you can pretty much go to the second link which I posted which shows uh, Shin Megami Tensei wiki page uh, full of, uh, that has a list of the uh, arcana or you can scroll down and you know you'll find the arcana and you know you could pretty much match the um, you know you pretty much match what your personality type is to the arcana that's uh, listed and then you know you could go back to. Oh, I'm sorry. The second page was the uh, just a different website, not the not the wiki page. The third po that was the third link. The third link is the wiki page, and that's when you'll find. That's when you click on the arcana that matches your personality type, and from there, all you have to do is choose which persona um, relates to you the most from the list within the arcana from uh, all the games. You don't have to choose one from just one or two, you know. And um, that's pretty much it. And you know, if you want more details, you know, if you want any more specifics uh, about more about this, just you know, just send a send a comment in the in the comment section, and you know, answer anything. And um, you could also see what your shadow is from this kind of you could look up what the shadow of your personality type usually is or you can pretty much go to the reversed arcana uh, on the wiki page and figure out what it is and, or you can just look inside yourself and see what really bugs you you know what really bugs you about yourself because that's what your shadow really is and you know it's pretty, it's, it's all really interesting, and see if it matches up with any of the other information you find. And, you know, please, also, please answer these questions as honestly as possible, you know, the more accurate your, uh, results, the, uh, the better, you know, the better you'll be. And so that's all I have. So anyway, thank you guys for watching, um, I'll see y'all later.